bright duty. Every student matters. If the trait A exists in 10% population and trait B exists in 60% of the same population which reproduce asexually, then which trait is likely to have arisen earlier? So, trait A is present in only 10% population and trait B is present in 60% population. So, as you know, in asexual reproduction, the variations are very limited. Okay, so the next generation are almost exact copy of the parents. So, that is why if a trait is present in large population, that means it has been there for a longer duration of time and it was passed on to the next generation. So, we can say that trait B had arisen earlier because it is present in larger population. Question number two, how does creation of variations in a species promote survival? Okay, we know that variations are quite helpful for the survival of the species. So, how does it help? Okay, do, what are variations? Let's first understand that. Dur variations means when uh, the new generation which are born out of the first generation, they are not exact copies. There is some change in any one of the character that is called variation. Okay, so in asexual uh, reproduction, variations are very limited, but in sexual reproduction, during DNA copying and then uh, then the combination of fertilization of male and female gamete, there are certain variations which can take place. So, in uh, during this uh, reproduction process, DNA copying takes place, and this DNA copying is not hundred percent accurate. There might be some slight change in one of the uh, one or the other reaction. So, what happens? The new generation will be a little different from the parent generation. So, if these variations are favorable, then the next species will survive. These variations will help in survival. But if the variations are unfavorable, then the next species will, the next generation will be wiped out. They will not be able to survive. For example, let's say some bacteria, they became resistant to heat due to some variation in DNA copying. Now, this is a favorable variation because they can survive even during high temperatures. Okay, But the others in which the variation did not occur, they will not be able to survive. So, certain favorable variations help the species to survive. Okay. Next question. How does sexual reproduction gives rise to more viable reproduction and uh, how does it affect evolution? So, as you know, what happens during sexual reproduction? Uh, this is, let's say, a, a female cell okay, and a male cell. So, this is male and this is a female cell. So, uh, for, firstly, what happens? Meiosis takes place. In the process of meiosis, cell divides into two and which each cell contains half the number of chromosomes. So, in this case, what will happen? They will divide into two cells with half the number of chromosomes. While in this female, again half the number of chromosomes. These special cells which contain half the number of chromosomes are called, are called gametes. Okay. The gametes take place in, uh, take part in reproduction. One male gamete and one female gamete, they fuse together to form the new generation. This is called F1 progeny, first generation. So, what happens during sexual reproduction? There is a first, the chromosomes, they divide into half and then they fuse. So, due to this new combination from the parents, there are more variations. Individuals, these individuals are not exact copies of their parents because a new combination of genes has taken place. So, these variations, they help the individuals to survive and they give an individualist, uh, individualism to the uh, new generations. So, that is why sexual reproduction is more viable form of reproduction and because of this, these changes, generation after generation, they, the sexual reproducing organism, they quickly evolve. Okay, Evolution is faster if we compare it to asexual reproducing organisms. Next question, 
only variations that confer an advantage to individual organisms will survive. So, I just told you in the previous question also that the variations can be favorable or unfavorable. So, only those which are advantageous to the in organism, they will be able to survive. Let me explain you with an example. Let us see, uh, let us imagine there was a, a population of red beetle. Okay. Due to variation, what happened? The few beetle, they uh, changed into green color. Okay. So, there was a variation and among a few species, few organisms in the species and the next generation was green in color. So, now this variation is advantageous. Why? Because they will be able to camouflage with the green leaves or grasses. So, uh, if, an, uh, if an organism comes to hunt them or to eat them, they will not be able to see these green beetle. But the red one is clear, are clearly visible sitting on the leaves. So, they will be wiped out because they will be eaten up by other organisms more easily than the green ones. So, this kind of variation which help the organism to survive in the environment are called favorable variations while if uh, the red one was an unfavorable variation. So, favorable variations help in the survival. You must have heard this phrase survival of the fittest. This is an example of it. Why are traits acquired during the lifetime of an individual not inherited? So, as you know, there are two kinds of traits. The inherited traits, which we get from our parents, which are actually inherited during reproduction. The other ones are acquired traits. Okay, The acquired traits are those which we acquire during our lifetime. These are structural, functional or behavioral traits, which we actually develop due to either some disease or trauma or maybe some learning. For example, if you take a lot of training and you became a good dancer, then that is an acquired trait. But uh, the color of your skin or your height, these are inherited traits. So, the acquired traits are not inherited to the next generation because they do not cause any change in your DNA. Okay, so they just, they are just structural changes. They might change your muscles, the functioning of muscles or maybe the structure, but no change in the DNA. That is why they are not inherited to the next generation. Next question, why are small numbers of surviving tigers a cause of worry? Okay, why we should be worried that tigers are such small in number, they are left in so small number. So, basically what happens in sexually reproducing organisms, the, the genes, the chromosomes, they are transferred from parents to offspring generation after generation. So, if this number keeps on decreasing, what will happen? The just gene, uh, this gene pool will be totally lost and the next generations uh, of humans, they will not be able to see the tigers. They will be completely wiped out from the earth once we lose the gene pool of tigers. Now, the next question is, what are the different ways in which individuals with a particular trait may increase in a particular population? Okay, So, uh, as we studied that there are certain variations after each generation and it is a very, very slow process which uh, is not noticeable in one or two generation. So, uh, individuals with a particular trait will survive in a population. What are the various ways? The one of the ways is genetic variation and natural selection. I give you an example of green beetles. So, green beetles will survive. So, the, uh, in, they will survive in this coming population because they have a favorable genetic variation. So, if uh, this is also called natural selection because the nature, it selects those which have favorable variations. The next question is, what factors could lead to rise of new species? So, new species can rise due to these three reasons. First is genetic variation. So, during sexual reproduction, some uh, large amount of variations takes place in uh, each generation. And in asexually reproducing organisms also, variations are there due, due to DNA copying. Although it's, uh, the rate is low, but it is still there. So, due to when these variations keep on accumulating, it sometimes gives rise to 
new species over generations next is natural selection okay uh, so in this case if there is some uh, genetic uh, variation sudden genetic variation in a group of organisms and their genes are totally different from the existing gene pool then they will not be able to reproduce among themselves so this uh, in those organisms in which Uh, the genetic variation is there uh, they will reproduce among themselves and this will give rise to new kind of a species third is reproductive isolation so if a suppose let us say few organisms were living together belonging to the same species and they were able to reproduce among themselves and then there was certain barrier uh, let's say uh, uh, some hill or some maybe due to crack on the earth or uh, the the organisms were put apart and they could not reproduce among themselves because there was a natural barrier like a sea or a river like that so now these two groups will are not reproducing among themselves so they will we will uh, notice different kinds of variation in these two groups okay and over the years this will give rise to two different kinds of species okay then they will not be able to reproduce among themselves after generations because of different types of variations in these two groups the next question is will geographical isolation be a major factor in speciation that is formation of new species for those orga organisms who are asexually reproducing or for self pollinating plant so the answer is no okay because in asexually reproducing organisms the new organisms are formed only from a single parent so if they are geographically isolated from the rest of the organisms then also they'll keep on reproducing among themselves because only one parent is involved so we will uh, not notice any formation of new species by geographically isolating them and similarly in self pollinating plant also since Uh, they can survive even without cross pollination so even if we geographically isolate two species it will not lead to formation of new species because they'll keep on self pollinating two parents are not required in both the cases next question give one example of characteristic being used to determine how close two species are so the answer to this is the homologous Uh, organs okay for example the four limbs of humans birds and let's say frogs okay we all all three organisms uh, humans birds and let's say frogs okay all these three organisms have four limbs structurally the four limbs are same okay structurally they are same but they have been uh, dif they are been used for different purposes humans we use it to grasp things birds use their four limbs to fly while frogs they use to jump and hop okay so such characteristics although that since they have similar structure so they tell us that these species are closely related these species might have a common origin ancestral origin next question can the wings of butterfly and the wings of bat be considered homologous organs as you know that homologous organs are those which have similar structures but are used for different functions just like four limbs of humans birds and bats structurally they are different but functions are diff uh, structurally they are similar but they are used to perform different functions but in case of wings of butterfly and wings of bat the structure is not similar okay wings of butterfly are made, made up of very thin membrane but the wings of bat are made up of folds of skin okay it belongs to insects group while this belongs to the mammals so structurally they might appear to be uh, same uh, functions both the wings of butterfly and wings of bat both the use their wings for flying so function is same but the structure is different so that is why these are not homologous organs such organs are called analogous organs so next question is just the same what are homologous and analogous organs so i'll just repeat homologous organs are those organs of different organism 
having similar structure but different function. Example is four limbs of humans, birds and frogs. They are similar structurally but they, they are used to perform different functions. On the other hand, we have analogous organ. Examples are wings of butterfly and wings of bat. Okay, structurally they are quite different. Wings of butterfly are made up of thin membrane while wings of bat are made up of folds of skin. But function is similar. They both use it for flying. Such organs are called analogous organs. Next question. How are the areas of study of evolution and classification interrelated? In this uh, chapter, we have studied about evolution and in your previous class 9th, you have studied about classification of organisms into different groups. So, these two studies are quite closely related to each other. We put the organisms having similar characteristics into one group and organisms having different characteristics into different groups. So, those organisms which are put into one group, actually they have, uh, they have sim uh, similar ancestor. They have evolved from the same ancestor. And those who are put into different groups, we actually come to know that they have evolved from different ancestors. So, they are quite interlinked. Next question, what are fossils and what do they tell us about uh, evolution? Fossils are the remains or the impressions of those organisms which lived in the ancient times. Okay. So, the study of fossils actually has helped us to study evolution because by studying fossils, we have come to know that the present organisms have evolved from the previously existing organisms with the, in a series of slow evolutionary process. So, evolution is Although slow, but it is a continuous process and we have come to know this by studying the fossils which we have found. Next question, what evidence do we have for the origin of life from inanimate matter? So, as per the scientists, life originated on earth from inanimate matter, simple carbon dioxide, water molecules, these molecules combined together and gave rise to complex organic matter which then gave rise to earlier organisms and due to evolution over the millions of years present organisms were formed. An experiment was carried out by Miller and Urey. What they did, they created an, an atmosphere which was actually supposed to have existed on earth millions of years back and they maintained temperature, high pressure and they stimulated lightning. So, what was observed that inorganic uh, uh, compounds were formed out of simple inorganic matter that is like amino acids and carbohydrates were formed. So, this gave us an idea that actually life originated from inanimate compounds.